So welcome to today's webinar, Can Energy from Cold Ocean Water Replace Fossil Fuels, featuring Jeff Kremer. Uh, Jeff, as you know, is, a, is a, a professional engineer, mechanical, and has a plan to revolutionize the global energy network. It's extraordinary what he has in mind. Uh, the presentation that we've prepared, he, he's done it for us in advance, expands on the ideas from his book uh, entitled Infinite Resources, which describes how we can use the temperature difference between the cold polar night air and the relatively warm polar oceans to generate more energy than humanity uh, currently uses. Why this is particularly interesting is we are at a time where if there's any topic that gets more attention than artificial intelligence, it's climate change. Uh, and I am absolutely delighted that he, uh, Jeff's put this together for us. Uh, and so without any further ado, let's see what he has to, has to share. Hello, my name is Jeff Kramer, and I'd like to welcome you to my presentation, How to Replace Fossil Fuels with the Energy of Cold Ocean Water. Thank you to Kerry and the KEI Network for allowing me to present on this. Um, this talk is based on some information from my book, Infinite Resources. And the subtitle of Infinite Resources is How to Sustainably Develop the Arctic by Supplying Green Hydrogen, Fresh Water, and Healthy Food to the World While Mitigating the Negative Effects of Anthropogenic Climate Change. So how can we have infinite resources on a finite planet? Well, if we look at this definition of infinite being immeasurably or inconceivably great or extensive or inexhaustible, and we look at this definition of resources, a natural feature or phenomenon that enhances the quality of human life, then we can come to the uh, way that I mean infinite resources in the book. And an example of an infinite resource is the water cycle in which um, the sun evaporates moisture from the oceans, purifying it and uh, raining it down on land, which of course has been going on for long before man existed and likely will continue after um, we moved on to the next phase of evolution. So um, yeah, that's an infinite resource. So what do you see in this image? Um, I asked uh, Bing image creator for uh, an image of the frozen Arctic Ocean at night with low light conditions and northern lights and a landmass in the distance. And it came up with this, and it's a beautiful image. Uh, I'm quite impressed with it. It even has stars and, and such. But uh, looking at it, you couldn't uh, be blamed if you thought that it was just an image of a frozen wasteland uh, in an in inhospitable location. Obviously, the Arctic is remote, um, lots of ice and snow. In the winter, we've got darkness. And here we've got the uh, solar wind interacting with the Earth's atmosphere to create the auroras, um, which is kind of an interesting effect. And I'll uh, talk a little bit more about that in later images. Let's look at uh, Canada's Northern Territory. So we got Nunavut, Northwest Territories, and Yukon Territory. Um, together, they have a combined population of about 131,000 people and an area of over 3.8 million square kilometers. If we compare that to where I'm from, uh, I live in Black Falls. So the next community south of me is Red Deer. And the next community north of me is Lacombe. Uh, if we take essentially the size of these three small cities and add them together, we have a population that is greater than the total population in all of Canada's Arctic territories. And for comparison, um, that's an area maybe 50 kilometers long by 10 kilometers wide. So a total of 500 square kilometers. What, what don't you see in this image? So if you think about what's below the ice, we have liquid water. And that liquid water is at a constant temperature um, at the interface between the ice and water. It's always an equilibrium and that temperature is minus 1.8 degrees Celsius. Um, below that, we in the water, of course, we have life going on as it usually does. In the winter, of course, we don't have photosynthesis, but um, you still have fish, you still have copepods, you still have all sorts of things that are basically hibernating until the light returns. 
Um, we don't see the cold of the atmosphere. So the Arctic uh, air temperature can be anywhere from, you know, obviously uh, the, the low teens uh, below zero to minus 70 degrees below zero. And in Antarctica, it can get down to as low as um, below minus 80 degrees Celsius. The coldest temperature ever recorded in Antarctica by satellite was about minus 92 degrees Celsius. You don't see the cold of space. So literally, uh, the background radiation of space is just a, about three degrees Kelvin or three degrees above absolute zero. Um, we don't see the infrared heat escaping the Earth and, and going into space. And um, we also don't see the mineral wealth or the strategic location of the Arctic, uh, particularly Canada's Arctic, in relation to uh, protecting the United States and Canada. So the question here I have is, if global warming is the problem, then shouldn't we be maximizing the natural mechanisms for global cooling? Um, one technology that we're all familiar, uh, just driving down the highway, you can see wind turbines. So let's just talk about these for a moment. Uh, I, I have this picture here because I wanted to look at mooring systems. But uh, the largest wind turbines that are currently in production are um, approximately 9.5 megawatts made by uh, Vestas Corporation. And so that's 9.5 million uh, watts of, of power when they're operating. Of course, the wind is one of those intermittent wind, uh, energy sources. So um, if you think about how big the uh, swept area of those blades is, it can be as much as three football fields in area. And if you think about the energy density that uh, they're trapping uh, to, to create that electricity, if you were to put a barometer in front of the wind turbine and a barometer behind the wind turbine, you'd essentially have the same measurement. It's atmospheric pressure. Of course, because of the, uh, the velocity of the wind downstream of the wind turbine is just slightly less, that's where they get their energy from. But if you think of how big these structures are, um, it's very low power density. Um, one of the things that uh, a company in Norway is developing is counter-rotating wind turbines, and they're building a 30 kilowatt uh, prototype. If that is successful, they plan to build a 40 megawatt prototype. So that would be more than four times, you know, that Vesta's uh, wind turbine that I was talking about. So let me talk about ocean thermal energy conversion. This is a technology that's been around since before the 1920s, but it's never been successfully commercially developed. Let's uh, look at what, what's going on here. So if you go in the ocean anywhere around the world, so this doesn't matter if you're talking about in the tropics or if you're talking about in the middle of the Arctic, the temperature down about 1,000 meters below the surface is around 4 degrees Celsius. Of course, in the tropics, we have warm temperatures. Um, so in this example, it's 27 degrees Celsius. And in theory, you should be able to operate a uh, vapor power cycle between those two temperatures. So the idea is you take a low boiling fluid like propane, uh, you heat it up with the warm surface temperatures, you run it through a turbine, and then you condense that working fluid on the cold ocean water um, coming down from coming up from the uh, thousand meters below, and then you pump that um, back at pressure to go boil and go through that whole cycle again. So this has never been commercially successful, and and the reason is because by the time that you take into account heat exchange between four degrees and 27 degrees. So there's only 23 degrees to begin with. If you subtract another five degrees at either end, being optimistic, you know, you're down to about 13 degrees. And uh, then you have to take into account the energy that it takes to pump the water up this kilo kilometer long tube. And in the end, you, you don't end up with uh, enough, uh, enough energy to make it viable. So this is the concept that I'm working with. 
uh, I call this ocean atmosphere temperature differential energy conversion. And this idea is not unique to me. I actually read about it in a book called Engineer's Dreams uh, in the 1950s, but they didn't elaborate on it. And so I've taken that idea and run with it and expanded on it. So if we take that same concept, uh, if we have high pressure condensed propane in the atmosphere and we run that through a high pressure pump, down into the ocean water, um, it will eventually uh, rise in temperature to the point where that that uh, liquid will turn into a vapor. And that vapor, of course, can run through an engine and produce electricity. And then it would be condensed in the cold Arctic air to, uh, to be a liquid again and repeat the cycle. Of course, we're going to capture it. And since we're talking about propane here, you obviously don't want that to get into the environment. It's too costly and uh, environmentally potentially a bit hazardous given the uh, higher uh, greenhouse gas potential. Anyways, the power that can be generated by the uh, polar energy platform, as I call this, uh, this kind of floating structure, is only limited by the size of the equipment, the pumps, the engines, the generators, and the pipes that carry the fluid. So... You can literally scale this up from a few kilowatts to several gigawatts. This, if you're an engineer, um, this might be familiar to you. Uh, this is a propane saturated vapor table. And the two important things to uh, look at here are the temperature in uh, here measured in degrees Celsius and the pressure of the propane at that corresponding temperature. Uh, so this scale starts at the low end, so minus 113.4 degrees Celsius, and continues up to uh, warmer temperatures at the bottom. Perhaps I should invert that, but uh, anyways, that's the way it, it is here. So what I want you to notice is when you're at really extremely low temperatures, the uh, pressure is very low as well. This is essentially near vacuum. So most people don't know what a megapascal is, so I've converted it to uh, atmospheres here. So the boiling point of propane is at about minus 42 degrees Celsius. That's where it has one atmosphere of pressure. In other words, if you take the propane tank that you use for your barbecue and it's at minus 42 degrees Celsius and you were to measure the pressure of the gas inside of that bottle, contained inside the bottle, it would be at one atmosphere. Uh, if you heat that up, like we do in, in the summertime when we're having our barbecues, or even if you consider, um, you know, a, a winter day, let's say it's minus 1.8 degrees Celsius, that corresponding pressure would be four and a half atmospheres. So again, the pressure is listed here. So four and a half atmospheres is about here. This is about one atmosphere. And that minus 42 degrees Celsius that I was talking about earlier, that's comparable to the uh, temperature if you were looking at water of 100 degrees Celsius. So water starts to boil at one atmosphere and that's 100 degrees Celsius at, at sea level. So between these two, in, the, in this example, the freezing point of ocean water is also one, uh, minus 1 1.8 degrees Celsius. So between approximately four and a half atmospheres and one atmosphere, you have a differential pressure of three and a half atmospheres. And that is enough to operate an engine on. So this fellow, Aswath Rahman, uh, has developed a technology with his associates, uh, which essentially radiates heat into space from the surface. And he talks about, in his TED Talk, he talks about how we can um, reduce the temperature of something below ambient temperature. And we can use that to operate a heat engine. So this is uh, a heat engine basically takes a high temperature and a low temperature uh, differential. If you have a, a difference between high and low temperature, you can run an engine and generate electricity. And uh, here we talk about the cosmic microwave background that has a temperature of, like I said, about three degrees Kelvin. Uh, let's talk a little bit about computer data centers. So uh, computers, the use of computers uh, is 
and, and the electricity they consume is increasing by about 8% a year. Um, and so clearly, if you're uh, working in a data center like this, and it's say lo located in Palo Alto, California, you're going to have significant cooling losses um, to operate that data center. And here's an example where the energy required to cool the electrical computer systems is actually as much energy as it is to operate the computer service servers and then uh, beyond that you've also got storage for drives or electricity for storage drives in the network uh, i wanted to also point out that the arctic now is becoming well connected not only is there a fiber optic cable line that's being built between japan and uh, Europe, I, I think it may be completed now, or it's very, it should be completed this year. Um, we also have access to space-based telecommunications like Starlink. Um, one other energy source that we can use in the Arctic that uh, isn't seeing a lot of use in the uh, more civilized and, and populated areas um, is nuclear energy. And the reason we can do that, of course, is because there wouldn't be as many people screaming about uh, not having nuclear energy in their backyards. So I'll talk about one advantage of nuclear energy in, in, in a moment uh, in conjunction with this other energy source that I was talking about. But um, we can have an entire nuclear power cycle um, based on a steam uh, cycle and generate all the energy from uh, from that nuclear power. But then we can use the condensing water, which of course, as I mentioned before, condenses at about 100 degrees Celsius. Um, we can use that condensing water to heat the propane and uh, take advantage of that and have a, a much more efficient propane cycle. Uh, one of the things that I wanna mention about nuclear energy is A, it's abundant and we can use uh, thorium cycle, which does not produce any weapons grade material, is uh, inherently much safer and the uh, reactors can be designed in such a way that they can never have a, a radiation leak like what we've seen in uh, Fukushima or uh, Chernobyl. So let's take a look uh, quickly at the water uh, system here. So if you take a, a block of ice, let's say from a glacier in Iceland or something like that, and you warm that ice, well, of course, as you get up to the freezing point, that ice is gonna start melting and it's gonna stay at the freezing point until all of the solid water has been converted to liquid water. And you can tell here that there's a significant amount of energy that's, that uh, has to be put into that ice to make that happen. Um, so here, the latent heat of fusion is 334 kilojoules per kilogram. And if we take that melted water and continue heating it up, it has a specific heat capacity of 4.2 kilojoules per kilogram. Um, once we get up to the boiling point at sea level, again, we have to provide a tremendous amount of heat to the water to make it evaporate. So going in reverse, if we're condensing from a nuclear reactor on, into propane, all of this heat energy is going to be transferred to the propane and um, we can bring that propane up from you know, the zero degrees that we can get approximately from the ocean. The other thing to, to note here is the ocean itself has a lot of liquid water. So if we can extract heat from that liquid water, we can take advantage of this 334 kilojoules per kilogram. So let's take a look at the, uh, the chart again, and I've added a few uh, extra points on here. So the normal natural uh, air temperature in the Arctic would be someplace between minus 20 and minus 83. Um, so these could be the condensing temperatures that we would normally work with, as I mentioned before. Propane boils at a standard atmosphere at about minus 42 degrees Celsius. This is the temperature of the ocean ice. Uh, so we can reliably reach this temperature by evaporating propane in liquid water and it will form ice. 
Then we can also use um, basically heat pump technology, so the same stuff that's going on with your refrigerator, um, to increase that temperature. And the beauty of a heat pump is that they have very high, uh, what they call coefficients of performance, uh, compared to the energy input. In other words, you can transfer much more heat than the amount of electricity, electrical energy that you put into the system. And for uh, about a 30 degree temperature difference, like uh, raising it from minus 1.8 to, to 26 degrees Celsius, that would be probably in the range of around eight, uh, coefficient of performance of eight. So in other words, if you put in one kilowatt of energy, you can recover eight kilowatts of energy from the ocean in the form of heat. So take a look at what that does in terms of the pressure. If we just were boiling the propane at the uh, ocean temperature, we'd be at about four and a half atmospheres. But by boosting it up to 26.7, we're essentially at 10 atmospheres of pressure. So that's a significant return on your uh, investment. So in other words, you're, you're more than doubling the, the pressure, uh, but you're only expending one eighth of the energy that you're putting into the system. So that's a good return on your energy investment. And I call that bootstrapping. Then let's take a look at uh, using the waste heat from the computers. If we had a, a data center on board the ship, you can see that would be up around 71.6 degrees as an example. Some computer chips uh, operate at higher temperatures. So that gives 26.7 atmospheres of pressure. And then, uh, as I mentioned, condensing nuclear steam, you're looking at nearly 100 degrees Celsius. And the big thing to point out here is if we can use, uh, you know, the uh, radiation of heat into space to our advantage, we can get down to really cold temperatures. So the difference in pressure here uh, is a very small fraction of an atmosphere. So we go from at 96.6 degrees Celsius we have 42.4 atmospheres, essentially vacuum at the cold temperature. That gives us a delta P of essentially 42.4 atmospheres. So you really don't lose much on the, on the cold side of things. And of course, that's significant amount of energy that we can produce from that. Um, let's take a look at the what we can do with that electricity. Well, we can form hydrogen through electrolysis. And if we capture some air, uh, nitrogen from the air, we can produce ammonia. Um, right now in Alberta, we have Canadian Pacific operating a hydrogen locomotive as part of their fleet. And uh, as far as I know, that's going quite well. Um, they're using, they convert the hydrogen uh, using um, um, a, a fuel cell and uh, then they convert that to electricity so it's very similar to uh, how they convert the diesel engine power they run a generator and then run motors to drive the uh, locomotive but if you have uh, hydrogen of course that's lighter than air so that could potentially be uh, a way of floating lighter than air ships and you can use those to transport goods around the world as well um, I, and I'm thinking primarily of the fuel itself as being the goods, but there's some other things that we'll talk about coming up. Uh, and if you got ammonia, you can use that essentially as a replacement fuel for for uh, diesel. Uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but uh, the fastest air recorded aircraft officially uh, was the X-15 uh, from the United States. It was one of the aircraft that uh, Neil Armstrong was a test pilot of. And the world record speed was uh, achieved in that aircraft, but it was a rocket engine uh, powered by ammonia. So ammonia can also be used for fertilizer and as a feedstock for explosives. So it has a lot of uses. And right now, uh, when we produce fertilizers, uh, with ammonia, essentially we are using the uh, coll collecting the hydrogen from natural gas and carbon dioxide is a, a result of that. With the system I'm proposing, it would be completely green without any additional carbon dioxide release. So can the ocean freeze? Well, of course, we know as Canadians that it can freeze, but I got this from the uh, National Ocean 
Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the US. And I just highlighted this uh, phrase here. When salt water freezes, however, the ice contains very little salt because only the water part freezes. It can be melted down and used as drinking water. So uh, let's talk a lot about water desalination. Much of the world, we don't have enough water for uh, for people to use for their daily needs. In fact, two, over 2.2 billion people don't have access to reliable, clean drinking water. That's pretty incredible in, in a world where we're talking about colonizing um, another planet that not everybody can, like, when I say not everybody, I'm talking about like about more than one in four people don't have access to clean drinking water. So how can we change that? Well, there are several methods for desalination. Um, the the most economic ones uh, tend to be around, around um, reverse osmosis, but there are still desalination plants in Saudi Arabia where the energy is relatively inexpensive and they are essentially burning uh, fossil fuels to boil water and then condense the water. So you can imagine that that has a significant carbon footprint to it. So the process that I'm talking about that I described already produces a lot of ice. Ice, ice, baby. Potable ice, ice, baby. So how much are we talking about? Um, well, if we think about ice, uh, when it freezes, of course, it becomes less dense than water. So it actually expands by about 10%. So a cubic meter of water would freeze into uh, one meter by one meter by 1.1 meters. And if we were to take 16 of those cubes, we would essentially have a truckload uh, that can be transported legally on streets without any special uh, additional axle weight protection or anything like that. If we take a thousand truckloads of ice, so that's 16,000 tons of ice, uh, we get what I call a tanker, and that would be about 110 meters long uh, by 12 meters deep and 22 meters wide. Combining 25 of those tankers, you would end up with what I call a berg, which is 400,000 tons of ice, and then we can create the what I call superbergs by uh, basically putting all sorts of uh, these assemblies together. And in this case, uh, here's a depiction of what uh, 2,240,000 tons of ice might look like. It's uh, 734 meters long by about 115 meters wide and 64 meters high. And uh, a five, approximately 5 million um, ton superberg would be uh, almost a kilometer long at 942 meters by 230 meters and 64 meters high. So in comparison, uh, the tallest building in the world, the Burj Khalifa, falls in between those two lengths. So imagine uh, being able to transport that much ice and, and you'd be shipping it, say, through the Strait of Gibraltar. And as you're going into the Mediterranean Sea, you're breaking off these little bergs off of the main uh, main ship, I guess you could call it and sending them off to you know Algeria and France and Italy and um, Tunisia, Egypt, and all the way over towards Israel. Uh, each country could have a, a little bit. And what are we gonna do with that water? Well, initially, what I envision is for the more developed countries, we would sell it as bottled water. Um, and we can talk about that in the question and answer period, uh, the, the pros and cons of that. But um, how much would a power plant uh, like the one I'm describing create? Well, a one gigawatt power plant would produce approximately 5 million cubic meters uh, every couple of weeks. And uh, in 2023, global bottled water sales were approximately $342 billion US. So initially with this, we would be producing green energy, but the most profitable uh, center could be selling water. Uh, what else can we do on the polar ice cap? Well, if we have fresh water and we have energy to suck heat out of the ocean and, and put it into a greenhouse or a shipping container, and we have electricity for producing lighting, all we need is then fertilizer and a substrate to grow plants. And thanks to illegal marijuana grow ops for many years, um, we know how to do that. 
Uh, how about open ocean fishing? Well, if you look at this fish farm, uh, there are advantages, first of all, to, to farming in the open ocean. Uh, the waste products from the fish don't, they'll fall to the ocean floor, but they won't toxify the local water, so the fish themselves will be healthier. But if you look at this, you can see that the most expensive part of this operation is the actual platform where the people live and work. Uh, the actual pens themselves uh, aren't very expensive by comparison. And how much would a, a, a polar energy platform cost? Well, I took the, uh, I, I, I don't have a good answer for that. So I, I have worked as an estimator in the past, but I just don't have enough information to estimate what these costs would be. So I'm going to give a, what I think is an extremely high estimate and uh, use that for the basis of uh, discussion here. So the, the most expensive oil platform ever built was the Berkut oil drilling platform, uh, which is controlled by Russia. And uh, it costs $12 billion US approximately. So I figure if we design a platform to to uh, withstand even tougher conditions than that's designed for, let's add 50% more to the cost of that platform. That brings us to $18 billion. And to make it a nice round number, we'll put in a $2 billion contingency. So $1 billion dollars, of course, is a significant amount of money. Um, but even at that rate, um, we can see uh, what's called the overnight cost for different power sources. So a coal plant, you're looking at about $6,500 um, per kilowatt. Um, and if you're looking at nuclear, you're looking at anywhere from uh, 67 to uh, $7,500 per kilowatt. Some of the least expensive forms are understandably wind power and solar power. Also natural gas um, is a, a fairly inexpensive source as well. Um, the nice thing about fossil fuels and nuclear energy is that you have uh, a really good uh, conversion factor. So in other words, you can run a nuclear power plant almost 100% of the time. And obviously you have to shut it down from periodically. But uh, same thing for a gas-fired plant, whereas wind power is reliable uh, anywhere from like 20 to 50 percent of the time, and uh, solar uh, energy is likewise, uh, you know, only available 12 to 30 percent of the time, because even when the sun is shining, we often have cloudy days. So with storage, those uh, efficiencies increase, but the point is that um, wind and, and solar are both fairly diffuse energy sources, so you need to have large uh, photovoltaic farms or large wind turbines and lots of them. So in that example, let's say that Vesta's nine and a half um, megawatt uh, wind turbine that I was talking about, let's just call it 10 for ease of calculation. You need to have 100 of those to produce one uh, gigawatt of power when the wind is blowing. So using the numbers that I have at $20 billion for a gigawatt of power, that would give an overnight cost of $20,000 per kilowatt. Clearly that's not cost competitive. But my thinking is that if we were to take that prototype and design it to be mass produced, and we you know, produced hundreds of these, we should be able to bring the cost of those down by a factor of 10. And I think any engineer here we'll agree that the, the cost between a prototype and a mass-produced product is easily uh, one-tenth of the uh, prototype cost. Then I take that concept and I take it one step further. With artificial intelligence and robotics and how far the, fast they're advancing, it's conceivable that we could build these power plants without the need to have human life support there. So if you look at this oil platform, Almost everything here is designed around human beings. So you need to have a place for people to sleep, people to eat, people to work, people to um, be entertained. Uh, all of that takes space and is one of the most expensive aspects of building a platform like that. Well, because the process is so simple, just boiling ammonia and condensing it and generating power and, and uh, you know producing hydrogen or ammonia or, or some other product, 
we should be able to eliminate much of those things. And even if we had like one platform that was populated by um, humans, we could potentially have you know, 10 or more platforms that are operated by robots and the humans could go out and troubleshoot when necessary. So if we can do that, I figure we could drop the cost by a factor of 10 again, and that would bring us down to about $200 per kilowatt, which is by far the cheapest source of energy of anything that is shown here on the chart. So uh, that, of course, means that we have to be able to control our AIs and our robots and that they will be friendly towards us. We don't want to end up in uh, an iRobot situation or worse yet, a Terminator situation. But assuming that we can manage that, I think the future looks bright for this technology. So what do you see in these images? I see opportunity. So I'd just like to leave you with some quotes from one of my favorite uh, thinkers, Peter Diamandis. Imagine a world of 9 billion people with clean water, nutritious food, affordable housing, personalized education, top-tier medical care, and non-polluting, ubiquitous energy. Building this better world is humanity's grandest challenge. And then a couple of other quotes from him. The world's biggest problems are the world's biggest business opportunities. And the best way to become a billionaire is to help a billion people. So uh, I, another thing I'd like to point out is uh, this Polar Energy Platform, PEP technology, uh, also goes a long way to reaching all 17 of the United Nations Millennium Development Goals. So uh, I'll open it up for questions. This is my contact information, and I look forward to uh, discussing this with you. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll leave that up just for an extra few seconds. So, uh, Jeff, this was extraordinary. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so very much for putting the time and effort into putting the presentation together. I'm going to look for yellow hands and any any, uh, any questions that might have. But Jeff, how how did you get into this uh, this space? I mean, this this is an extraordinary. You're not talking about going to Mars. You're talking about using what we have here on on, on Earth. But uh, how how did you get into this? Uh... Yeah, I. Uh, it, it's interesting. I. I was first introduced to, um, you know, renewable energy uh, in grade four. I remember that uh, there was a little comic book that came through that all the students got. And, and uh, I was like, oh, this makes a lot of sense. And I, in the early 1970s, I also um, uh, remember watching, uh, uh, you know, a news piece on, on hydrogen. And, and the fellow was, uh, he had a hydrogen engine and he was uh, drinking water from the exhaust pipe. And uh, anyway, so I, I had that interest uh, sparked in me early on and throughout high school, I continued to uh, to follow it. And then I came across that book that I mentioned, Engineer's Dreams. And it, it's a fascinating book. It was written by a, a fellow who is an associate of um, uh, Werner von Braun. And he wrote a book about the, the trip to the moon and all that. But um, he, he wrote this other book. And it talks about things like building a tunnel underneath the English Channel and uh, harnessing volcanoes for energy like they're doing in Iceland now. And and so a lot of and wind power, he, he predicted wind power uh, would become common and all these other things. So uh, I would say probably about 70 percent of what he talks about in there uh, is, has actually come to pass. Uh, anyway, so, yeah. As I went through uh, university, I, of course, studied mechanical engineering. I studied Stirling engines with uh, Dr. Joe Walker, who was uh, the world expert in, in Stirling engines at the time. He since passed away, unfortunately. But um, uh, through that, I learned a lot about thermodynamics. And um, uh, and once I learned about the Stirling cycle and you know Carnot cycle and, and Brayton cycles and all these different uh, Things that got me thinking about different processes, and and I was like, you know, why why aren't we taking advantage of of these natural resources that are out there? I mean, energy is all around us, um, and, and uh, we're just you know we're we're using some of the most polluting technology, uh, and and don't get me wrong, I'm not anti oil or or, or uh, anti fossil fuels. I believe they're a necessary stepping stone to uh, moving on to the next. Um, level, which is what we're talking about here. But uh, uh, I think eventually we need to get off of them and, uh, uh, you know, live more ecologically sound. So 
don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, well, it does. Uh, I mean, I, I'm always interested anytime we're doing a webinar on the the personality, uh, how how we arrived at this point, and the big ideas that you know, that, that roam around in their brains uh, that ultimately emerge into a book. Um, you you've been uh, you've been entertaining this idea for some time, and you obviously put a book together and put some passion behind it. What's the probability of, of an investor or a firm like BlackRock or whatever actually putting a billion dollars aside or it, probably more a nation? You're probably more likely to find an investor at a national level that says anyone bordering the Arctic, that be uh, uh, Denmark or Norway, uh, Russia, the United States and uh, Britain. Have you had a chance to put your book in front of anyone uh, at a national level? That's well, it, it's kind of interesting you mentioned that. That's part of the reason I wanted to, uh, you know, attend this group because I know that there's a lot of people who are well connected here and uh, might know somebody who who would be able to pass this along. I, I also was uh, recently informed that there's uh, going to be a conference on developing the Arctic in Calgary in March. So I'm I'm going to try to get in on that. Uh, it's too late for presentations, but uh, certainly I'd like to get there and chat with people. And that's a. Uh, uh, an association of business people and government and indigenous groups so uh from across canada so i think that'll be uh, a, a good place to to talk about these issues um and and as far as writing the book it, it's kind of interesting i'm glad to see that robert j sawyer is here and uh, he's one of my favorite uh, possibly probably my favorite science fiction author and uh, for years, I've been uh, thinking about writing a science fiction book, but uh, I finally came to realize I was more interested in the science than the fiction. And, and so I figured that this would be the way to go. Um, so anyways, thanks for that, Robert. <laughs> what, fa what fascinates me, uh, Jeff, I spent some time consulting in the Northwest Territories. Uh, uh, one of the engagements was uh, the potential of the Mackenzie River becoming an import-export uh, channel for North America. And it was a byproduct of that assignment that I got intrigued with the Arctic Ocean, which at that time was in ice. Uh, now, now, now people are talking about it and its commercial relevance, not just the Northwest Passage, but how to harvest the, uh, the hydrocarbons. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, har you're harvesting what everybody knows, which is cold. Um, it would seem to me you're, you're transformative. You're helping us think about the Arctic as, as indeed cold, but as a source of energy, not using uh, hydrocarbons, but recognizing the asset that exists naturally could in fact become a, a source of energy. This is, this is big thinking. Uh, and I can also recall reading, I don't know whether it's popular mechanics, but someone talking about harvesting the icebergs of the North and, 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 uh, uh, transporting them to the the warmer climes and you've addressed the same thing with your your tanker export of of uh of polar ice uh actually yeah. created ice i think this oh. is brilliant thank you uh, um one of the other things i talk about in the book is so we've got an excess of cold of course in the arctic so the process that i'm talking about would be producing potable water but if your goal is to just produce more ice, and one of the issues that the Arctic is facing right now is uh, uh, the, the polar ice crap cap is shrinking, well, you can just pump seawater through that uh, two meters thick ice layer, and it will naturally freeze. Of course, in that case, the salt has nowhere to go, so it'll be frozen inside of the ice, and you'll end up with uh, water that isn't potable then. But it's still useful because, like you said, if we use that same kind of thinking about um, transporting the ice, we could take that down to, say, the Caribbean and, uh, you know, have it well insulated. Uh, and with the distribution that I that I uh, envision in there, we could potentially stop a hurricane before it ever forms. <laughs> so, so you can just uh, imagine that ice, of course, will float on the ocean surface. As it melts, the salt inclusions will be denser and the, they will drop down. But the the uh, remaining water will be uh, essentially fresh water and it would form a layer across the ocean, assuming that you, you, it's not too turbulent. But um, we know that if you go to Cenote in, in, in Mexico, they have a layer of fresh water sitting on top of uh, salt water and so it's natural in estuaries all around the world so they the two try not to mix because they have different densities and to form a hurricane you need to have 
26 degrees Celsius or higher. So if we can reduce that surface layer just momentarily at the critical point when a hurricane's forming or the thunderstorms are forming into a hurricane, we could potentially stop a hurricane from forming altogether. No hurricane, so you, you are a dreamer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the headline to me, and I, I, I may have, uh, I may not have really had the depth of understanding that I have now. I, I would retitle your entire, the, the entire dimension to, to rethinking the Arctic. Mm -hmm. I mean, rethinking the Arctic is to recognize it as as an energy source. Uh, we we recognize it as cold, uninhabitable, maybe melting, but you know, that, that sort of secondary. You, what you have op opened up is a whole new way of thinking about the Arctic a, as an energy source. And that's exactly the opposite of what we've traditionally thought about. <laughs> Getting in front of billion dollar investors, that, that's typically, I mean, your SMRs are becoming a, a reality uh, and money is starting to flow into SMRs. And, and, and one of the reasons is because as, as an energy source for the the Northwest Territories, uh, Inuvit, uh, all of the population that's in fact living in the North, they're looking at SMRs and you're looking at them uh, as it relates to uh, energy source for the Arctic. Um, the beauty of this is that it's scalable. Like I, I think I mentioned in the presentation, you could do like a one kilowatt uh, plant. And in fact, this could be as simple to demonstrate as um, taking a propane bottle uh, when you're going ice fishing. Um, have it connected to a small turbine. I think something like a Tesla turbine would be a good example. Um, and then have a condensing radiator type system. Uh, uh, and and if, the, if the temperature is cold enough outside, you should be able to boil the propane in the water, um, run it through that turbine, condense it, and then pump it back down um, in the ice for a, a recurring cycle. In fact, one of the ideas that I had for uh, you know commercializing this would be for ice fishers and they could uh, have their own little um, you know tent or, or or you know inflatable enclosure that they could uh, watch the football game in while they're uh, ice fishing and playing poker with their friends or something like that out on the uh, ice but staying nice and warm up the whole time. so. Is there anything you could do on a smaller scale? I mean, as soon as you get into the billion dollars and you get into the utopia of saving the world or, re or rethinking an entire continent like the Arctic, you enter into the world. You enter into the world of imagination and dreamers. Is there anything on a smaller scale that you could use or demonstrate in order to begin to wake people up and actually helping them think about these applications that you've thought about? Yeah, so I, if you look at like Yellowknife on, uh, in the Northwest Territories, it's right on Great Bear Lake. And uh, you could set one of these up. It doesn't have to be salt water, of course. Uh, in fact, fresh water freezes at a slightly higher temperature than the salt water does. And um, you would just end up with essentially an iceberg floating in the, um, in, in the lake at the end of the uh, winter which then you could turn around and, and build a solar tower and uh, use that cold then to condense, you know, a water vapor cycle and, uh, and generate power both ways. So, well, let's get, let, let's, get, let's get closer to home. I mean, not, not my home, but the home of millions. Could you do anything on the Great Lakes? So the, the, the thing is you need to have a pretty decent temperature difference. So, you know, uh, as cold as it is right now, and we're we're running uh, about minus 30 here in, in central Alberta, um, that would probably be, you know, minus 20 would probably be the minimum. And if, to have that consistently uh, to generate the, the power. But again, if you were going to use that bootstrapping idea that I was talking about, uh -huh. potentially you could. Okay. But I mean, I'm, th these exercises are as much to open up your imagination as they are eyes. Uh, it's, it's a very ex interesting exercise to open your mind and uh, and see uh, the, the whole Arctic from a different uh, point of view, as uh, Perry mentioned. Um, I was just wondering if, uh, so for example, the issue of uh, cutting ice and moving ice kind of uh, uh, would concern me from the point of view of shifting uh, uh, who knows what points of equilibrium uh, there in the Arctic. 
But uh, the thing that stuck uh, to my mind was the very high difference, the delta in temperature between water and air that it's specific to the Arctic. That, um, as you've mentioned, uh, using some kind of um, uh, technology of energy transformation like the heat pumps uh, can actually um, capture that energy and then allow you to, to ship it where it's needed uh, and so on and so on in an interesting uh, novel way. Um, the challenge that I see, as uh, Perry has mentioned and Yogi has uh, pointed to, is that um, you need, at least in the initial phases, to make a case for very high initial investments. Yeah, like this, uh, this whole notion of uh, developing an actual ice plant in the Arctic, so to speak, where the ice plant, instead of uh, taking ice from the Arctic, makes ice in an efficient way using that delta temperature and so on. Yeah, so like, very... like I said, it, it's it can be scaled down. It doesn't have to be a gigawatt. Um, and so I, I would I don't think that there's any investor who's a billionaire who would say, oh well, let's just throw a couple of billion dollars at it and, and do this. No, they, you would start with a, a pilot plant that you know might cost a few million dollars to prove the concept and then uh, build it on up from there. Yeah, well, I'll tell you where. I mean, when I was in the Northwest Territories doing consulting, one of the things that was extremely obvious was the, the costs of energy, the costs of power in the Northwest Territories uh, and, and the moving in of, of huge truckloads over the ice, uh, uh, ice bridges in order to get the, to the mining. The mining industry in the Northwest Territories, which continues to evolve and open uh, and huge opportunities there, their primary issues are energy. And they've talked about SMRs. I mean, if you have an option on how to get energy into the Northwest Territories by capitalizing on the, the cold in the Arctic, I mean, you're onto something that uh, NWT Power would probably be very interested in. And, and they've got the capital and they've got the capital from the federal government as well as from the NWT and none of it as well. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a lead for you is uh, NWT Power. Yeah, and I mean that, that's what I'm looking for here is uh, you know to get the leads, to get the names of people that uh, I should be talking to, and you know it, it would only take one uh, you know one billionaire to um, to catch on to this idea to to take it to the next level, and uh, it, it's well, interesting. I, I, I'm not I'm not talking about a billionaire, and I think we need to get our mind off that. I oh, oh yeah, sure, it, it, even but, governments, and and just well, to reach. It, it, yeah, a corporation and or government that sees yeah. it as an opportunity to, in fact, help us civilize the Northwest Territories, which today continues to be a, a drain on the coffers. It, it's viewed, I remember, I remember talking to Joe Clark about this some years ago, Northwest Territories to most politicians in Ottawa is a defense issue. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. But for, for other Canadians, it's a source of investment. I mean, I mean, talking to the owner of the Yellowknife Inn and Yellowknife about why Canada invests so billions of dollars in a population that was hardly the size of Red Deer and Lacombe, it had to do with defense. And I didn't understand that. But that was the fear of the, those in the Niagara Peninsula of remembering 1812 and an invasion from the north. China is interested in getting into the north. Maybe China investing in a platform of this sort would be interested in uh, because it would be a, a vehicle to get into mining in Northwest Territories. I, mm -hmm. I don't know, but yeah, I think you're onto something. The question is how to open up the door. Go yeah, ahead, yeah. Greg, you've That's got a question or a comment? Uh, you got two more questions in the chat and I just want to interject. Uh, New Brunswick Power, you should talk to. They are a uh, the only uh, utility in Canada that hasn't broken up between generation trans uh, generation transmission distribution uh, because they try they unbundled rebundled uh, they are the test case in the world for distributed energy having large scale traditional and all forms of traditional power generation from hydro to nuclear to uh, fossil Tidal. fuel fired title uh, so so uh, embracing that transition. And when I worked with them, 
a few uh, not that long ago they were partnered with a little company called Siemens hmm. and Siemens of all the com partners that they can look at in the entire planet picking New Brunswick power for a power uh, you know the transformation of distributed renewable energy systems hmm. and how that would impact traditional large-scale utilities so that's an avenue there. Uh, I think her name is Lori Clark. She was VP of operations. Now she's the CEO. And I know some people know some people, which helps in New Brunswick. To, okay, so it's, a, it's like a big complex company, but it's like you're working in a small town. Okay, yeah. there, there's a lead. I, I'm going to, we've got a few more minutes. I'm going to wrap this up by zeroing in on the, on the negatives. And maybe there isn't a negative <laughs> here. A number of the chats have asked questions about impediments, environmental impediments, investment impediments. What, what, what do you envision on the downside uh, to the environment, yeah. uh, to the, the issues? So I, that's a question that I get quite a bit. And, and I, I just recently answered that to somebody on LinkedIn. So apart from the you know, the carbon that's going to be released when you build this thing, I don't see there really being a negative because what are you producing? You're producing cold brine. And when that falls to the ocean floor, that actually strengthens the uh, um, AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. Um, when you're, if you're just, if you don't do anything with the ice and you just produce it in place, you're actually strengthening the polar ice cap. And um, like, I figured that, if, if you built about 3,000 of these, you'd be able to um, replace all of the, like, make the equivalent amount of electricity as is being produced in the world right now. If you did 6,000 of these, you would produce as much water as LA County uses every year uh, in, in excess. And that's for all uses, industrial and, and so forth, um, and, and agricultural. So, um, it's it could be a game changer if we're you know focusing on getting water to the people who don't have water there's 2.2 billion people who don't have access to reliable uh water every day uh and you know about a billion people who are um uh, well I, I don't remember exactly what the number is 300 and some odd million that are undernourished and then a whole bunch that are overnourished i guess you could say that the un council mall is being malnourished so um so all of these issues you know, I, I, unfortunately, I was only able to talk about a, a few things in the book, but yeah, we can supply food, electricity, and water with these systems. And because the Arctic Ocean is so rich in nutrients, uh, we would not be, you know, we would not be adding pesticides. We would not be, uh, you know, adding, uh, uh, you know, you wouldn't be getting PCBs in your fish any more than you would from natural fish. And the Arctic Ocean is still one of the least polluted uh, oceans in the world. So, and same thing with Antarctica. So these systems would operate between the Arctic and the and Antarctic um, every year. So, okay. Uh, Greg, okay. Any, any last, any concluding comments? And I'll do a wrap up. Okay, no. good. I saw your hand still up, so I didn't delete it. Um, rethinking the Arctic, that's certainly my, my takeaway. Uh, which I'll be sharing in a in a summary comment for the newsletter. Um, I want to thank you, and I only have one other question. I, I, I'm intrigued, as I'm sure many are, about the uh, ramifications of actually using AI and using AI as a vehicle for actually getting your costs down. I, I I don't think that's fanciful anymore. I don't think it's even futuristic. It would seem to me mandatory yeah. that if you do something in the inhabitable environment of a very cold Edmonton and even colder uh, Arctic, um, then AI would be a, a brilliant solution. And, and maybe from there, we can begin to depopulate Edmonton because this is freaking cold right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, just re with regards to that, the, um, uh, the technology is really uh, getting to the point. I could see literally thousands of these things operating the way wind turbines or, or oil pump jacks work without hardly any human supervision and the wealth that they could produce, uh, you know, could kickstart something like uh, universal basic income, which, you know, could help well, the people. When you talk about thousands of these, the one thing I will leave with you, and I would be interested in a follow-up is scalability. Uh, at the billion dollar level, you may find a, a low take up, but if you can envision this technology on a smaller scale in, in, uh, and more distributed, um, it's a whole new discussion. And I don't know whether you want to comment on that just now or leave that as the takeaway. 
Well, I, I've been talking with some people who have uh, contacts with Indigenous groups, and as long as they live close to a, you know, a reasonably deep lake, um, we could get them off of diesel potentially over the winter months and, uh, you know, produce enough energy to last them through all year long, I expect. Uh, your book, uh, if there are those uh, as a takeaway today that would like to read your book, is it available via Amazon? How might they get a copy? Yeah, so if you're in Canada and you go to Amazon.ca, um, it's a, it, the the price on the cover is thirty five dollars, but uh, we're promoting it to Canadians at twenty dollars uh, Canadian. So uh, if you buy it from the states, it'll be twenty dollars US, and the UK is twenty pounds. <laughs> so there was a reason why I wanted to be Canadian. So thank you very much. Uh,